What's up, gangsters? It's time for a new adventure. I am going to build a tank. Also, I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay, so yeah, what the heck is going on right now? I, <laughs> I don't know. But I have been uh, talking about building a tank for a while. And I've just been kind of waiting for the right moment, the right motivation, whatever. Anyway, um, it came up because um, my buddy Justin Lentz decided to <laughs> start uh, one of his random group builds on SMCG. And um, it's called the Damn You Justin Lentz build, very appropriately. I'm uh, sure I'm going to be repeating that quite a bit. Um, anyway, the rules are simple. It has to be 148th scale armor of some kind. It, we have till the end of the year to finish it. And since today is November the 16th, that means I've got six weeks-ish. Um, and you have to just be totally irresponsible and push whatever else you're working on aside and do this. So I'm like, all right, sweet. I could do this. Um, and so of course I went looking for a kit and I picked the most obvious one because it says easy right here. That, that, that's the most important part. Um, it has stuff in it. Um, let's see. Authentically reproduced in compact 148 scale. I like that. Realistic depictions of HVSS. I don't know shit about tanks, but I know that that stands for um, high value suspension shit, I think. Engine grills, deflector, and more. More. Type T66 tracks. I don't know. That's this kind, I guess. And uh, features one-piece straight sections. Okay, well, that's cool. Ah, that means these are uh, what you tank guys call link-in-length -length tracks. That should be good. Uh, Commander Torso and figure. Um, I guess that's this guy. I don't know who Commander Torso is. If he was, like, famous, uh, won, like, the, you know, Medal of Honor or something. I don't know, but that's great. He's in there. So let's open the box and see. Ah. Yeah, there we go. I hope that's the hardest part of the whole project. So, oh, I like this. There's not very many sprues. Anyway, I'm going to get them out of the bag now. All right, I like this. There's a few sprues. They're already in the right color. Maybe I don't even have to paint it. That would be great. There's some kind of a piece of string here. I don't know what that's for. Maybe to hang myself if I get really frustrated. And there's like five decals. So this should be sweet. So let's build it. Uh, let's see. Let me get, let's see. All right. This should work right here. Okay. Expecto Constructum. Wow. Holy shit. That actually worked. <laughs> yeah, I could get used to that. If it we're only really that easy. And you know, the truth is, is that with Tamiya kits, it does sort of sometimes seem like that because the engineering and the fit is always just so good. Whoops, yep, they're totally flying apart as I'm trying to talk about how cool it is. And of course, the gun barrel flew off to the part of the workbench where it's hardest to get back. Anyway, yeah. So, this is where I'm at after uh, a few days and some enjoyable hours of assembly. And I'm not gonna go all the way back through like the whole business um, and really talk about this kit in detail because that's already been done by others much more effectively than I will do it. But I do just wanna say a couple of things. Again, engineering and fit is just really fantastic. Like this turret is four pieces. Uh, well, I guess five if you count this. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, six. Yeah, anyway, whatever. And, I mean, look at how good they go together. That's the joint between 
the three parts that make up the bustle. Yes, I've been learning all kinds of new things about tanks. This portion back here is called the bustle, and this is a high bustle style turret, because, uh, yeah, because it's up higher. Yeah, like unlike earlier Shermans that had a lower bustle. Anyway, yeah, the fit, the engineering, it's just all really good. I mean, if you didn't know that that was a joint, you wouldn't know. So, really good. Same thing with the boxy part of the tank. They give you these weights. I guess that that's just so the whole thing has a little bit of heft and it feels, you know, cooler as a model, I guess. I don't know, but anyway, that's what those are. And all of this just really fit together well. Now, you may notice that I have some super glue in a few places. Basically what my strategy was on some of this was where the parts did not just mate perfectly with zero, zero, zero gap. What I did is I put them together, uh, put some extra thin in there, and then squeezed them and applied some uh, black CA and some kicker to basically use as a clamp to hold them there. And that's a, that's a pretty good strategy for stuff like that. So that's that. It's all done together. Uh, for the main portion of it. Um, and so what's next now um, is, at least for this part of it, is to start looking at all of the corrections that I want to make or additions. Um, and, and, you know, this is kind of cool. It's not like an aircraft model where you just automatically have all these gaps to deal with or joints to deal with because they're all on actual joints where the panels are or the plates are welded together. So I don't know if I'm going to do anything to like enhance weld detail, but there are some places where there's not any weld detail. Like all around the base of this this thing here, that's called the turret splash. It's where bullets can splash up against it. Um, there should be a weld there. I believe that's a cast piece welded to plate steel. Uh, same thing, I believe, around these bullet splashes here. Um, you know, they included them like on that doorstop. That's what the engine doors, this thing right here, when you open it up, it flips back this way and rests on that chunk of metal right there. They've got a nice weld bead there, so that's pretty good. I may do some weld beads, I don't know. There should be a weld bead all around the uh, uh, sides of that... Uh, thing protruding out of the back of the bustle. And I do obviously have some joints to deal with because those things should not be there. This turret is all sand cast as one big piece. So there's that. Then there's the matter, speaking of casting, of deciding what I want to do for casting marks. Tamiya has molded in a lot of really nice texture for casting marks. And in some places I'm just going to go with it. I may choose to enhance it in other places because while it's really good there on the top of the turret, it's not as good on the sides. And these things were manky looking because, you know, it's a big chunk of cast iron, cast steel. And, um, you know, when, once they broke it out of the mold, it would have a lot of defects on it. And so they would do a lot of grinding and um, and so they were all pretty textury. You can see a little bit of it. Tammy has really done a nice job of, of putting like grinding marks there on the face of the, uh, I guess this is the differential housing. Yeah, I don't know shit about tanks, but I'm learning. Um, anyway, so they've done a good job with that, but I'm again, I may enhance it. So we'll see. Um, so, you know, once I've got gaps and that sort of thing taken care of, then I start wanting to think about improving shapes. Oh, these brackets or whatever they are right there, they should have welds around them as well. So i got to do all that. Um, then, like right here, okay, these brackets that hold the fenders on, yeah, they're, they're pretty chunky because they're injection molded. That would be probably pretty good as a photo etch part, but ain't, got nobody, ain't nobody got time for that. I'm not doing any photo etch on, on this one. But what I am going to do, I experimented a little bit. You can see that one there by my thumb where the, the little line in the middle of it, where it's a little deeper and a little wider. So I've just been using my Paul Budzik 
special scriber to get in there and just dig those out. And it works pretty good, pretty easy to get to. Just get in there and just work on scraping those. Trying not to get too out of hand. So that's basically the, the thing there. Um, and then there's stuff like um, all over the place. You've got these little nubs, those rectangular nubs. Yeah, those are supposed to be grab handles. So obviously I'm gonna wanna fix those. Now the standard way to do that is to drill a couple holes, get yourself some wire and bend yourself a, uh, a handle and stick it in there, super glue it. And that's great, that's you know not a big deal. But I'm looking for fast and easy and precise. And since there are one, two, six, seven, eight of them on this, yep, I think that's right. And then there's one up here, uh, maybe more up here on the turret, a couple more there, there's one on that hatch. Yeah, ain't nobody got time for that because I got a 3D printer. It took me about two minutes to design and get set up for printing a tiny little handle. You see it right there. So I've already printed out a whole bunch of them. The first one was just a test fit, but it worked good. And this is a pretty good example of pushing my printer. It's my EPAX X1 4K. It's got an XY resolution of 31 microns and it does pretty good. These are printed at 0.05 millimeter layer thickness, which I thought might be a little too much for this, but worked good. That uh, handle, the diameter is uh, 0.3 millimeters. And I even put a flange on there so that it goes into the exact depth. So what I'm doing is I just go and I use this chisel. I think this is a trumpeter chisel. And I chisel off the little rectangular nub. Um, well, actually, I use my super sweet God Hand SPN 120s to trim most of it off because they are good for that. And yeah, anyway. So once I got it most of the way off, I chisel it off, and then I use that as a guide, and I've got a set of dividers here that I've set to exactly 2.5 millimeters, which is exactly what I designed the width of the little handle to be. And I punch a couple of holes, make them a little deeper with uh, this, so that's my center punch. And then I just come in there with a, uh, a, uh, a number, what number is it? It's a number 80 drill, 0.0135 inches, which is just a little bit bigger than uh, the 0.3 millimeters. In fact, it's a little tight, so I just, you know, work the bit, you know, in and out a little bit, makes a perfectly sized hole. And then this little handle just drops right in there. And you say, well, yeah, there's gonna be more fragile than wire. Well, yeah, of course. But I'm not gonna be actually grabbing them and using them to open that hatch. So, and they'll go on last, right before I've, you know, after I've done all the things I'm gonna do and uh, I'm about to do primer, I'll install all of those. And I think that's gonna work pretty good. So I'm pretty stoked about that. Um, we can we could even sort of test right now. Let's see how fragile it is, because that one's not glued in. I mean, I'm not really abusing it, but I'm also not being careful. I'm rubbing on it with my finger, and it's not just snapping off. So yeah, I think it'll be fine. All right, so that's that. Okay, so another thing that I wanted to address um, with a 3D printing or whatever. Um, is this piece right here. Okay, that is uh, a, uh, that's the exhaust deflector. You can see that. And um, 
With most EZ8s, at least early production, this was a sheet metal part, which you can see, that's not a great reproduction. Photo Etch is the only thing that's really gonna handle that, and like I said, ain't nobody got time for that. So that instantly became another 3D print CAD design and 3D printed part. Now you'll notice this one is a little bit, little bit different. And here's the reason why. Um, this one was gonna be, this version is uh, much easier to produce as a 3D printed part because it's got thicker sections. And the story with this is that they figured out that this sheet metal one was really not so good at protecting whatever's inside here from bullets and other fast flying sharp objects. So they decided to make this one out of armored armor plate. And it's a welded up structure. And those are like, uh, you know, the thicker ones are like a half an inch thick. So um, that's what eventually was on all easy eights. But in the beginning, they didn't all have it. They shipped out kits for, uh, for them to be retrofit in the field. Um, so you'll kind of see a mixture of it. But now here's where it gets kind of particular. And this gets into my plans for this project. So this is, I, I want to make this be any tank basically. But as it happens, Tamiya has given us a pretty specific tank, kind of a rare tank. And here's why. Now again, I don't know shit about tanks, but I'm learning and I've been boning up on my Sherman history. So now I can look at this thing and I can say, okay, this is an easy eight with uh, HVSS suspension. And if it's anywhere in Europe, then it has to be after late December of 1944, early January, 1945. And it's not gonna be in Italy, most likely, at least not if there's any combat involved, uh, because um, it, the the uh, the the HVSS tanks uh, were were dis were distributed in uh, late December, like they were manufactured in the fall of '44, distributed in December, and didn't really get deployed until after the first of the year. So. Again, not a lot of time for a lot of action between January and May of 45. And in particular with the HVSS, because there were only about, uh, out of the 2,600 Shermans that were, uh, or Easy 8s that were built, my understanding is that about 1,000 of them were this, were manufactured with this type of suspension. Uh, the, most of them got upgraded later on, but that's why you'll see a mix of easy eights with both the vertical volute suspension system and the horizontal suspension system. Anyway, so that puts this tank somewhere in Europe, probably uh, in Eastern Europe, if it's anywhere between May and, or uh, January and May of 45. The other thing that makes this one kind of particular is that it has the T66 style track, which I'm pretty sure uh, between that and the fact that it's HVSS makes this a Chrysler tank. They were built by three different companies, um, but you know that's not really super important. But the fact is that Chrysler developed that style of track and it was not super successful. Ultimately got replaced with the T80 style tank, which has a more of a, she uh, uh, sh like a chevron shaped cleat on it. So anyway, I sort of have to be careful. Um, and then, uh, even more specifically, <laughs> when you get into this exhaust deflector, there are only two known photographs, as I understand it, of tanks in the European theater combat zones with this installed. Now, that's just known photos. That doesn't mean that's all that we're actually extant. But point being is, that the number of possible tanks and places that this tank could be with this configuration is shrinking. <laughs> and that's kind of important to me because what I really started out wanting to do was a bunch of stuff with applique armor and you know different types of stowage. And I don't know that I really have uh, that many options now. We'll see, I'm continuing to learn. Anyway, so that's that. That's that's where that's where this is going, and that's what's happening there. 
you can see that I've got some uh, mounting tabs underneath there and that's how it attaches to the hull. So anyway, the next thing is, uh, yeah, wheels and tracks. So my plan is um, with these uh, link and length tracks to do the method that uh, Uncle Night Shift, uh, my good buddy Martin, uh, recommends on his channel, where basically you assemble the entire running gear to the tank hull and then wrap the well you glue the treads up flat and I'll go through this in the next video segment anyway you glue the treads up flat and while the glue is still soft you basically wrap them around the the running gear let the glue harden up and then pull it back off so that you can paint the tracks separately so that's the plan <laughs> but there's a lot of work to do between here and there and I've done exactly half of it and that's what this whole mess is so let me explain the first thing I wanted to do was get the bogies assembled and painted so that I could put them on there. So that's done. Um, and just so you know, what I'm working with right now is this SMS uh, olive drab. And I've been uh, trying some of this paint, Scale Modeler Supply, made by Scott Taylor in Australia. This is really good stuff. This is an acrylic lacquer that's ready to spray right out of the bottle. It's a lot like MRP, which you guys all know is my favorite, but this is really pretty close match. It's good stuff. So that's what I've been using. And um, so that's what's on, that's what's on these things. And I've also already sprayed the undersides of the hull and the fenders. And I don't really care if the color's not exactly right or if the paint doesn't look perfect at this point because there's gonna be a lot of weathering, a lot of pigments and oils and stuff going on under there. But after that, the next thing is to deal with all of these uh, road wheels and idlers and the fact that they have this parting line witness in the middle right there. That's just a thing because you, I mean, it's just a necessary evil of injection molding. So you can take each wheel off. You can hold it in your fingers and sand that off painstakingly. Yeah, no, I'm not doing that because of course I had to put my engineer brain to work on it and I uh, created these little mandrels that I 3D printed and I've got them super glued to the back of each wheel. Now, so first couple of questions I know. Well, how come you didn't just use a wooden cocktail stick and jam it in the hole um, and put that in your and put that in your drill? Because that's what ultimately that's for, is to put it here in my proxon. Um, actually, I'm using this one because uh, it turns well it turns slower but also because I fucked up hold on I'm gonna plug it in and then you'll see what I mean um, I fucked up because I made the diameter of the mandrel too big for the three jaw keyless chuck on my uh, other proxon this one goes quite a bit bigger, so it works fine. But this one also only turns 250 RPM, so it works great. And the idea is that with it chucked up in there, okay, then I just take a file, all right, and here. Okay, and even if it's a little wobbly, no big deal, because I'm not gonna press hard. I'm just gonna let the file do the work. I mean, it's it's almost just kind of resting on there. I probably should have filed off the uh, sprue gate nubs first. But anyway, so I'm really not putting much pressure on it at all. And so even a little bit of super glue is enough to hold it on there. I've only had one of them come flying off so far. So anyway, just a little bit of work like that. And that pretty quickly 
gets rid of that witness, and then you can come back and just a quick pass with a sanding sponge, and that is all cleaned up. Now, one of your questions is, wait a minute, super glue, how are you going to get it off there? Well, just like this. See? Just pops right off. I'm not putting much glue on there, and let me show you specifically on the uh, the road wheels what the deal is. Oh, man, I'm just out of control here. There's a flange on the back side of those wheels, and I'm only putting glue on the flat face of that flange. And the little nub of the uh, mandrel is really only there to center it up. Okay, so you can see that where the glue is and, and how that works. Now you'll, you'll notice that the mandrel, that that little nub is tapered and that's, that's going back to the why didn't you just use a cocktail stick and jam it into that hole and chuck that up or you know hold it in your fingers and twirl it around or whatever. Well, because you can see how tapered that hole is. It's not going to stay on the end of a stick that's just jammed in there. So, had to think of a different solution. And, you know, I don't ever need much of an excuse to do some engineering and some CAD design and some 3D printing. So, that's the story with that. That's why I've, and I, and I posted this on SMCG and people were like, yeah, there's got to be easier ways to do that. Yeah, there might be. But this is what's easy for me, especially given that I can just take all of these wheels while they're still on the sprue. And actually the first thing I did was, was prime and paint the back sides of all these wheels before I stuck these mandrels on there. So then I just take some glue, I put glue on three or four of them. I've already uh, uh, put some kicker on the mandrels and let it dry so that now when I just go and stick the mandrel in place, it's pretty much an instant kick and they're stuck there. So setting this up, really did not take long at all. So now the back sides of those are basically done. I also primed and painted the front sides. So the way this is gonna go is I'll clip these off, I'll do the sanding on all of them, then I'll take this mandrel off, and then I've got my other mandrel, which, and that's not really a mandrel, okay, it's these things right here. All right, these I made as masks for the wheels because the next step is to stick each wheel onto one of these. And I used a little bit of, of masking fluid to make sure that they stayed stuck, kind of just temporarily glued it on there. So I have it glued onto the mandrel, or it's not really a mandrel, glued onto the mask like that and I got them all racked up on this thing, and then that enabled me to come back and spray the rubber donut part of each tire and have a pretty reasonable color separation there, especially given that it is going to ultimately, like I said, get a lot of weathering action on top of it. And then I can just come in there, grab that little chunk of masking fluid slash temporary glue and pick that out of there. So yeah, again, is it ultimately faster than just doing it, you know, by hand and brush painting them all? Well, I don't know. For me, probably so, because I'm super slow. Um, but what I like is that it's basically a bulletproof process that gets me a really nice, consistent result in the end. I mean, that's, that's the great thing about airbrushing, um, especially with me. I'm always going to get better results with an airbrush, and I will <laughs> walk 
to great distances to uh, avoid having to do any brush painting. So anyway, that's that. That's where all this is. And I think I'm probably going to call it good on this episode. And uh, when we come back, um, I'll be working on all of the, uh, you know, things that I'm going to do to the hull of the tank. Okay, so there you go. Yeah, this is my tank adventure. And uh, as I keep saying, I don't know a damn thing about tanks. And I really have no idea what I'm doing. So I'm sure that the tankerati out there are, you know, that, that, that might happen to watch this are probably pointing and laughing because yeah, I'm sure my methods don't, uh, don't align with what is normally done. And that's all good. Um, I kind of like that I'm coming at this with no real prior experience and I'm just going on my instincts and who knows, maybe it'll all work out in the end. Maybe I'll figure out something good. I don't know, but I'm having fun with it. I'm learning some new things and, uh, Hopefully this is uh, entertaining and informative for you guys as well. So anyway, as always, I appreciate you watching. Much love.